Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway, and we are here with not good news for you. We thought that we were going to have some good news for you over the weekend, and we did. We we talked about K-State's latest commit in football, but today is all about basketball and where they go next because there were two big whiffs in the span of 48 to 72 hours for this staff, and it continues a trend that uh, I think some people have tried to hold off and, and be optimistic about how things are going and, and what the next steps are going to be. But really, at the end of the day, they start adding up, dating back to high school recruiting from a year ago or from the transfer portal last season, where K-State feels like they are an inch away from the finish line, but for whatever reason, they can't cross it. They are the hare, and all these other schools have been the tortoises, and it feels like the cause is being championed for K-State. Hey, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then, boom, it doesn't. So where does K-State go next after the two latest misses that involve Khalif Battle, who ends up choosing Gonzaga at the last minute, it would appear, and then Clifford Amore, which was always less of a certainty than Battle. I, the Battle and Amore thing are not similar, but the staff very obviously wanted Amore. He's a guy that they put a lot of effort into throughout the process and they don't get him. So they come up empty. There's still five empty scholarships on this roster, and that is even more of a problem moving forward now because Arthur Kluma, it's not just that his name is in the draft pool. He has entered the transfer portal, and you lost Day-Day Ames a week ago. So what? where do you think this team needs to go next in terms of either how they think they need to tool a roster and their portal target strategy or just in general what has to happen to regroup and – get back on your feet because the basketball team they have right now is not going to be a successful basketball team in big 12 play this coming year. You have to get more guys on this roster and not just guys that can take those scholarships, but guys that can actually play and be trusted on the floor because as it's shaping up right now, the high end talent on this team is better than last season. I think Doug McDaniel is the best player that has been on the roster the last two seasons now, but there's nobody else that you go out. Oh, you can you can stomach it with these eight guys. You know, it, it's it's a really good question on where K State goes from here, and I'm really interested to see what kind of progress is made with the remaining players in the transfer portal. Because I, mean, I think that it was a uh, it was you that uh, quote tweeted it from Kevin Sweeney that said that uh, just the t- 36 of the top 200 transfers in the Evan Maya rankings were still available. And that doesn't include guys that are likely to stay in the draft. And like I said, uh, I think it was last week that half of the high major rosters have at least two scholarships available. So there, there's running out of high end talent probably in the transfer portal where you could get somebody that you can come in right away, kind of like a Doug McDaniel and really think to yourself, wow, this is like somebody that could really come in and like immediately make a difference. But I'm still cautiously, I don't know if optimistic is the right word, but I I have a little bit of hope. And I think that it's just because there's so much that can change in transfer portal recruitment. Like, I mean, we're seeing it with uh, Trezarni and White. I'm going to, I'll take the first stab at the pronunciation of his name there, uh, where he announced the top three that didn't include K-State. And John Rothstein reported that he will be visiting K-State. So, I mean, just things can change so quickly. And, and I mean, the the bad example is Khalif Battle. Yeah. And and also, like, last year, the and basically the start of the process to the last three quarters of the process, K-State and Tyler Perry, there was never anything officially put out there. But from the very get-go last year, I had people down in in Lubbock of all places, but it makes sense because of Grant McCaslin that were telling me, hey, no, the, Tyler Perry, it's K-State. It's K-State all the way. So from the get-go there, it was like they were kind of silent in the background, but then it happened. And things can change quickly. And Trezarian White is one of those guys because not only is K-State in the fold despite three schools being put out last week, he also visited Texas Tech, and they were not – in the mix with those three. So yes, things can definitely change, but K-State has to be able to make those yes. things change because over the last two years now, it's other schools that have been able to pull that bait and switch on them. K-State has not done it to anybody else, and that's where things have to adjust quite a bit. Yeah, the the big thing is now, okay, you have these next batch of targets. There's still, still some really, really big fish out there, 
now it's go land one because you're you're in an a, a little funk right now where it seems like it's okay you've got doug mcdaniel prove that you can do it again because doug mcdaniels was a big swing and landed him cj jones was a big swing even though it wasn't really kind of showcased as one in his transfer portal ranking but beating illinois and creighton for his services i mean that, that's a that's a big swing that k-state got so I, I don't think that the process needs to be fully changed and be like okay let's just hit a lot of singles and doubles like let's get a bunch of role players to come in like no you still need to go after guys that you think are going to be stars and can be stars for you now it's all about how do you adjust your process on how you can get these guys closed down because if you haven't read what Derek put out about uh, Khalif Battle and how that kind of process went down, I, I have on pretty good authority that I can back up what Derek said about Case Aid and Khalif Battle. Yeah, there, there's there's good stuff to go read there, and I mean, it, look, this is not all on K State and a referendum on their staff. Like all these scenarios are individual. And things change, and it can be a crazy time. But at the end of the day, when it seems to happen over and over again, and the, and you get so close, like you have to do some looking internally and try to figure out what the problem might be. And at the very least, maybe it's not a problem, but it's not going your way. So you have to do something differently because you can't be standing here right now. And I mean, it's it's been two weeks since Jerome Tang went on the game with with Mitch Fortner and the K Man guys and said that you know in the next two to seven days we want to have the roster finished well here we sit well past that deadline and you've got a, you've got more of a roster to take care of than you did at the time you said that so there has to be an adjustment here and you see the the notable options out there a core core from Samford is a guy that is is going to be uh one of the hotter targets left in the portal he's going to be uh, going and checking out Auburn later this week which you know, Bruce Pearl in that situation, there's there's a chance that after he goes down there, he's not going anywhere else. Baba Miller is a guy that K-State has been on from the jump, but this is a recruitment that's taking a while, and I think that's your saving grace if you're a K-State fan is that you hope, hey, Miller's just being throw. He's taking his time. He's a little bit different than all these other cats, and he's maybe he's still got K-State towards the top. That feels like one at this point that K-State almost has to have given how everything else has gone. Then Wuga Poplar from Miami. We saw Norchad Omir. He committed to Baylor last night, which Omir is the better player of those two, but that's one Miami player that is off the board that K-State would have had interest in. TJ Toppin from New Mexico is a player out there, and then you mentioned Trezarian White. Those are probably the five best players left out there that we know there are somewhat direct K-State connections or high interest in, um, but they're going to have to find a way to get things figured out because – you referenced the tweet from from Kevin Sweeney, and it's it's good to look at and, and note about the the top 200 transfers according to Evan Biakawa's rankings. 36 are left, and over half of the high major rosters have more than two scholarships available. Um, and you go and can look at the on three ratings and and sort it by best available. There aren't a ton of guys left that are inside the top 100 of that list. Uh, and one of those guys is Arthur Kaluma, who is in the portal from K state. And then some of these other guys in all likelihood already have specific landing spots set up or are getting close to picking those. And others too are guys that are in the NBA draft process that probably aren't going to go back to school, but are doing it to keep their options open like a Coleman Hawkins from Illinois. But honestly, at this point, if we're talking about what's next in the strategic process of K-State, I think you're probably going to have to start exploring overcommitting NIL dollars. And I know that this is something that the K-State staff has been really reluctant on, is I, I think that they are they don't want to get into these battles with schools that are going to essentially overpay or overlook how some of this goes. Like that's just doesn't seem to be the way that the connection for K-State and NIL is right now. I think they view a guy and they say, we know that you're worth a maximum of this. It doesn't make sense for us to overpay that. But at this stage of the game, I think you are going to have to start to consider this because that goes back to the Sweeney thing. He, I think it was in a follow-up tweet that he mentioned, like the price is going to go up for these guys that are still in yes. the portal or whatever JUCO guys or uncommitted high school guys remain out there. 
So I think K-State is going to have to start to make some minor changes to how they do things, if not just for, you know, this year. Like, it, it could be a one-and-done thing, but you're getting to be in a dire spot with this roster because as it's constructed right now, again, this team cannot win games. I, I've been looking at it the last couple of days, and I you have one player that is, without a doubt, a star, probably an all-Big 12 caliber player in Doug McDaniel. C.J. Jones, it's going to be interesting to see what the jump up in a level looks like for him, but there is some positive buzz there, and it's like you mentioned, don't be fooled that he's coming from UIC and a bad team, and uh, the, the portal rankings, they don't, some of them don't even have him ranked. There was serious interest from a lot of big-time people. That is a good get for K-State. We'll circle back to that. Housen is a role player that fits. Now, do I think his role can be bigger than what it was at Villanova? Yes, I do. And then the next guy is David Gasson. That leaves you just four guys that, without a doubt, you know you can trust on the basketball court next season. After that, you start to look around, and your options there, Bayfall only played in nine games last year at Arkansas. I couldn't tell you the total minutes, but he averaged like six minutes a game when he did play. So that's a concerning thing. I don't know that – I think if all goes to plan, the staff was not counting on Bayfall having to play significant minutes this year. David Castillo is the next guy that I would mention, and you're banking on a true freshman being able to come in and help contribute immediately to K-State. That's to get to six. Now, if you know, Michaela Rich could play in there because you think, can he make a significant jump? But the only thing we saw Michaela Rich do last season was impressive dunks in moments that didn't really matter, either blowouts or against uh, non, non-power competition. And then Taj Manning is what he is at this point. So this roster is in a really tricky spot. K-State has some significant needs. We talked about the height issue uh, over the weekend, you and I, when we were discussing if Khalif Battle comes, you're still missing bigs to fill out this roster. And one of the bigs there, 6'9", David Gasson, I don't view him as, as starting material anymore. I think he could, but I think his role is best served coming off the bench and being a six-man, mostly like what we saw towards the end of last season, that seemed to be the best version of David Gasson K-State got, and it was in that bench role. Now, this coming year, he'll be healthier, so the minutes should be able to go up. But I, there's just a lot of things that you have to bank on right now that seem highly unlikely if you're K-State, and that's why you have to make some moves and, and get some things working differently. Yeah, there's a lot of holes, and it just doesn't feel like a lot of time. Just big picture for the transfer portal next year, and I, I mean, we talked about this when Day Day Ames left that uh, DY, you and I all agreed on that the worst part of Day Day transferring wasn't necessarily that he transferred because of like talent wise, but just how easy it is for guys to transfer because because of how easy it is for somebody to transfer like Day Day Ames when he saw Khalif Battle come in and, you know, everything that went down on Battle's visit. Uh, Ames ends up in the portal and then K-State is probably not really necessarily okay with it, but you probably feel a little bit better because you're like, okay, well, like we police battle is still, still there, but now you end up with neither. And it's just something to really think about. Like, does a portal window need to be closed or a shortened? I think it does. I, I think it's yeah. open for too long. I think it, if you're going to leave a place, you should know it within a two, two and a half week period. Like, I, like you know, I, it, I, I knew early on in jobs that I've left that I don't want to be here anymore. I, I know that when I get the chance, I'm out of here. I it, haven't just been like, well, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to mold this over. And the one time that I had to do that was, you know, when I was considering making the jump from radio to rivals a year ago. Mm-hmm. And even that process, it took me like five days to make that decision. You know, like, and, and I, you know, probably comparable spots if you think about it. I won't go into too many details about that. But I knew within those five days, it's not like I was like, well, give me give me three, four weeks and I'll, I'll have this figured out. If you don't want to be somewhere, you know pretty much immediately, yes. which is why the window for the portal to be open is flawed because if the NCAA wants to try to get a handle on the NIL and portal madness in any way possible, you have to shorten this window because the coaches would support it. And it works out for you because the only reason that guys are entering this late in the game is likely due to NIL money. And 99% Mm -hmm. of the scenarios where in that 
last week, week and a half that a guy's going to the portal, it's because of the NIL situation. And, and we can say that, hey, Data Ames thought that, you know, they're bringing in these guards and doing this. The report that he was going, his NIL agent gave it to the reporter and told him, like, I have a pretty good idea of why Day-Day Ames went into the portal. So I think that's the type of thing where the, the NCAA could help out here. Now, they're probably not because they jacked this up so poorly four, five, six, 10, 20, 50 years ago with how they ran things that now they're just like, yep, screw y'all, this is on you, figure it out. But I do think that the portal window probably should be smaller. I think that's the, absolutely correct. The other thing with the portal window probably needing to be shortened is it will help alleviate teams that have like four or five scholarship spots open because I know that Baylor just got Norchad or, or Mir, but they, their roster wasn't in a, as good of shape as K-State's either from a numbers standpoint. They had a lot of talent, but they still had four spots open before O'Meara. So I think that if you shorten the window, you can get guys in and guys that are, were currently on the roster will stay. And I think that that's a big thing because I think that that will help reduce the amount of open scholarships because there's there's a surplus right now of open scholarships and they're very deficient and guys that could probably fill those spots on high major rosters. Yeah, and um, and and next year it's just going to get worse because you don't have the COVID seniors anymore. So yeah, it, and, that, and that's that, the thing that's too. A big where deal. I wonder is that going to be helpful or? more of a problem for the portal situation. Because I do think in some ways it can maybe slow it down. Um, and by the way, I think if you go and look, I think it's 14 of the top 100 transfers in the on-three rankings are still in the portal. So the the value there is is pretty low. And why I say, hey, maybe if you're K-State, you need to get on trying to just, you know, uh, overcommit to some of these guys and hoping it works out. Now, the other thing, and I'll, I'll pose this as a question to you first before I, I go at it from the angle that I – think of we've seen a lot of big fish targets from k-state where if most of the guys we've talked about in this process it's not like you know you're kind of doing it in the margins and most of them are coming from significant schools um, like you think of khalif battle he's coming from arkansas it's a great setup clifford amore coming from rutgers not necessarily the same deal but Steve Peichel has things going in a good direction there, and he was one of the upper echelon guys. He was top 10 in the on-three rankings. Does K-State need to shift their focus to – this is not saying you go away from the, the big-name targets out there. Like, you still need to do that, but do they need to commit to hunting a little bit more for the guys in the margins lower on the board that – you know, maybe your possibility of landing them is greater and you feel like, I don't want to waste a spot on this guy necessarily. I want to be able to give myself a chance with these guys. But is that safer to build a roster that way? And therefore, you know, it, I think it, what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say, is it better in the portal to try and establish a higher floor than try and go for that really high ceiling? But, you know, if you fall off the ladder, you're falling a long ways and you're not just, you know, getting a bruise on your arm, you're snapping it in half. Because that's you know, where that, it feels like K-State is right now. It feels like they are snapping their arm in the transfer portal. That That is a really good question. And it's something that I've kind of thought about too, is how do you fill this out? And, and I think that you saw them kind of do a combination of that with adding Doug McDaniel and then adding guys like Bayfall and Brennan Housen. So I think that they've tried to do do a combination of that, and, and that's where again, like losing all four of Quest Glover, Data Ames, R.J. Jones, and Arthur Kaluma hurts. Because if they had at least two of those guys, I think that we feel better about where the roster sits right now. But you lose those guys and you lose Battle, and, and it makes you feel even worse. Because I think that they were getting a combination of the high end guys along with role players, which is something that they didn't really do last year. So I think that you saw them kind of pivot that way. And then now they're just in a little bit of a, I don't want to say a dire straight, but they, they need to get momentum back on their side. And that's where, if you can land one of the five guys that we have at the bottom of the screen within the next four or five, six days, I think people are back on board and thinking, okay, yeah we're feeling a little bit better about where we sit now because I don't want to say it because Amore and Battle, very, very good duo. But if you can get somebody like Trezari and White and Baba Miller, 
I think that you're at least feeling yeah better. Like you're feeling okay. And like that's a still a pretty decent haul. Or if you get like Poplar and a chore chore, I think that you're feeling pretty good. Yeah. And and so where I come from on this is think about where Iowa State sits right now. And this will this will probably light a fire and piss K State fans off uh even more when when we kind of look at it and everything. But Iowa State what they've brought in in the transfer portal this year, they have four portal commitments. They have Josh Jefferson from St. Mary's. He's the highest rated transfer they brought in. He's 129 in the on three rankings. Uh, he's the only four star transfer they brought in. They bring in Deshaun Jackson from Charlotte, Nate Heisey from Northern Iowa, and then Brandon Chatfield from Seattle. Those are all three guys that are outside the top 250. In case of Chatfield, he's outside the top 600. Now, those guys are not proven, but if you go and look at what Iowa State did last year to make their roster better in terms of how you combined high school recruiting with the portal, last year they brought in Keyshawn Gilbert. That was easily their best add uh, with how they they did things. That was a good pickup for them. Um, he comes from UNLV, helps them out massively. Pavletsky didn't really do much for him, uh, specifically in conference play. He was a Wofford transfer. And then Curtis Jones played a good amount. He transferred from Buffalo. None of those guys were highly thought of or you know, in, in some crazy position when they were in the transfer portal last season. If you go and then look at what they did high school recruiting-wise within all that, Milan Momchilovic is a really significant guy that they brought in, played a lot for him. Um, and then really nobody else in their recruiting class gave them much last season. We know that Omaha Baloo uh, didn't work out very well at all for them and ended up back in the transfer portal. But they've still found a way to be successful, and they've not brought in any of these overwhelmingly you know, star-studded transfer ads. They've found ways to add these guys that are under the radar, and then here they are in January and February, and you're going, how's this guy killing me? He was just, you know, he was playing – Sunbelt basketball a season ago, and now he's tearing us apart. What's the deal? Like, I, again, it will piss K State fans off, but there is an element here where Iowa State is finding a way to do all this in the portal era without whiffing big time on all these top end guys and getting guys that, I, as I say, in the margins seem to work out better. I, I think that some of that, too, especially with their portal class this year at Iowa State, has to do with they've been really good at player retention. So I think that if you find a way to be better at player retention, I think that you can find the guys in the margins. But Which I, I do I, think K-State is getting closer to being better at it. I've yes. talked about this with people. Doug McDaniel, two years left to play. C.J. Jones, two years left to play. Brennan Housen, two years left to play. Bay Fall, three years left to play. David Gasson is a guy. They brought him in in that first class. He's going to play three seasons at K-State. So they are getting better at that. But And maybe that sets you up better for next year. But Iowa State's been able to do this in three years under T.J. Otzelberger now, three seasons, and not skip a beat. K-State skipped a beat last year. I mean, I think I think the staff did a, as good of a coaching job as they could, given the, the circumstances of what they had. That team ended up kind of, you know, there were a lot of things going on. But they haven't skipped a beat, and we're trending towards seeing K-State have to skip another right now as things are set. I mean, there's a lot of time, but – given the time constraints that Jerome Tang specifically put on the portal in this process and how dire things look with the guys that are available, it, it raises some serious red flags. Yeah. So I, I just think that if you can get more player attention, I think that you could get more guys in the margins. I also think that with your players in the margins too, it depends a little bit on the year that you had and who you are bringing back. Because I think that you see K-State go after more guys like, that would fit the in the margins role. If you don't have Tyler Perry graduate, you don't lose Cam Carter, Arthur Kaluma doesn't transfer and declare for the NBA draft. So I think that they kind of needed to go for the splash, but I think that they also need more complimentary pieces as well. Yeah. And I think some of that just comes back to maybe the, maybe the staff has to rein in their expectations a little bit of what they, they can do or what needs to be done to make, yourself better because there's probably a little bit of overcorrecting going on right now for K-State where like last year was not fun for anybody. I, I can't imagine the coaching staff had fun because it was not fun to watch. Even though this team ended up 
you know, somewhat in the mix and they beat good teams and they could play at a certain level at times. And like last year was by no means a bad basketball season relative to what we've seen over the last five years at K-State. I mean, Bruce Weber had three God awful years and he didn't sniff in an IT uh, last year. If that's going to be the bottom, that's a lot better than it is. So I wonder if there's a little bit of an overreaction to what happened and think, okay, we got to move on. We don't need to overcommit to some of these guys because I was fully ready for them to move on from Cam Carter. And I don't know that that's a guy that you want to really bring back, but like Arthur Kaluma, maybe you should have worked harder to keep a guy like that or some of these other things. And maybe you're closer to being good than you think. And you didn't need to totally overhaul how you do things or who's on the roster to make you a better team. Yeah. And I think that that's something that, I mean, they're just probably going to have to learn more because as much as, we really like Jerome Tang, but he's only been a head coach for two seasons now. So I think that he's still kind of growing and developing. Somebody brought up the point of like, we saw Chris Kleiman go through like the same development and growing pains a little bit on the football side. So I wonder if we'll see a little bit more of like an adaptation and more growth from Jerome, Jerome Tang even next off season. We'll see, but I, it, this the reason why it feels so dire and important is because I do think that third year is really important. I think based on what I've observed, I think the third year is where the player retention, you can start to see it take an uptick. I, I definitely think that K-State is taking a step in that direction right now. So I don't want this to all be negative, but there are a lot of questions still lingering out there. And if you don't answer them now, it it's a lot harder for people to try and think that you're going to be able to answer them next off season. So I, it, it's going to be a fascinating follow. And as I'll show it one more time, but the, you know, kind of the top five guys that would feel like are out there for K state right now. If you get one of those, you're already in an infinitely better spot than you are right now. If you get two of them, then I do think that roster can compete and it'll be ready to go because the, the issue right now is you have a lot of guys that are going to be guards in some aspect that you just can't win with a team full of guards. You're going to need some of that balance. But if you can balance it out with the bigs, it'll make life easier on a young guy like David Castillo coming in. And then whoever else you add to fill out the roster, um, because you, you'll want to bring in experienced guys that are out there that are probably making a step up. Um, you'd probably like him to be a little bit more productive. But uh, honestly, a guy like Tyke Green, who they brought in that first season – he had played a lot of basketball at a lower level, but was a guy that, hey, if you needed to throw him out there, whatever, you can trust him. It makes sense to play him here as opposed to some really young, raw guy. You can do that if you have a little bit more of structural integrity with how the roster is built in terms of you got your guards here, you got your bigs here. They can all kind of work together. Right now, this roster just would not work together. Yeah, and I think that that's where we're going to see a lot of focus over the next – few days I think will be K-State trying to find somebody at the four or five spot and and who knows I, I know that ever since that uh, Baba Miller visited K-State Fort Atlantic in week four he's kind of gone dark but may, maybe that's something that happens for K-State gets K-State going in the right direction I, I just think that recruiting is so based on momentum that I think that you got one guy come in and I think everybody starts to ease up a little bit and feel a little bit better. You're right, but you have to get that one guy, and it's yes. been a while since K-State got that one guy because, I mean, if you, you go through and, and look at it right now and, and how it shapes up, yes, they got Bayfall uh, to, to commit. Uh, that was April 29th, so I guess close to a week ago today, but I wouldn't even necessarily like count that in with uh, how that ends up working out uh, because he's, he still feels like more of a developmental guy. You go back to Brendan Housen when K-State was able to land him. So you need it. Momentum is important in recruiting, and right now it feels like K-State has negative momentum in that. Something's got to change. They're going to have to do something quick because at the very least, I, you don't even have to land one of these big fish, but I think if you can just add somebody else to the roster where people can see the vision on how he can be a contributor next season – that's going to ease a lot of the pain that people are feeling right now and probably the panic that's out there too. I would agree. And I think that the other thing that has kind of 
I don't want to say caused a panic, but has made everybody kind of pause a little bit and reassess things is that you say that was a week ago when uh, Bay Falk committed, but in, in portal time, that feels like it was like two months ago because the yeah. portal just moved so quickly. So I think that's another thing that like... And the portal was still open when Bay Fall yes. committed. Like guys were... <laughs> there were still going to be more guys going in. No more guys are going into the portal now. No. So I think that that's something to also like keep in mind. Like you, when you can get momentum on your side, you got to ride it because a week ago feels so long ago. I mean, that, to the point where if Khalif Battle would have committed to K-State, we, we did two separate videos on Khalif Battle committing because Great point. We, we did one uh, a week before and then we did one right before uh, Saturday because we didn't think that it the first one was going to be usable because of how fast everything moves in the portal. So that I think that's something to keep in mind with the K-State coaches too, that I think that once they start getting guys, like you can't like ease up and take a little bit of a break and have a weekend with no visits. I think that it's better to, if you get a couple guys come in, commit, keep riding the wave, get other guys in on visits, get them to commit, and then you just keep keep going in that standpoint. Yeah, we'll see where it goes for K-State, but a lot that they have to get done and uh, probably a lot of scrambling and notes coming up in about the next couple of days and you know weeks, possibly, given the way that the portal season has gone for K-State once again. So if you want all the latest on K-State and the hunt to fill out this basketball roster, head over to On3, find K-State online, or you can go to kstateonline.com. We'll have you covered there, D.Y. and Drew, with some scoops. Also, on the football side as well, K-State does have recruiting momentum on the football side of things right now. They are getting transfers. They are getting high school commitments. That number, as Drew said, hey, after 4th of July, it's going to be at double digits. K-State's trending in that direction right now. Good things going on there. So it's not all doom and gloom with K-State sports. They took two of three from KU in baseball over the weekend as well. Uh, as as Pete Hughes and the Batcats try and prove the haters, me and many others, wrong, <laughs> that uh, they're silly and just unforgivable mistakes. They can somehow overcome them to be a good baseball team. We'll see uh, how they do that. They got a big series at West Virginia this weekend. So plenty of things to discuss about K-State sports. And if Drew and I aren't doing it here, a good place for you to do it is over at KSO on the message boards and uh, getting at us over there. So, for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. We're out of here. Thanks for watching K-State Online.